If you're like me, you like beer, and you're going to be there today at 4.30 in the Continental Lobby for Tap Joy's Happy Hour. I hope to see you all there. To get us warmed up for that, we have the John Radoff, founder and CEO of Disruptor Beam, and he is going to teach us how to redefine casual gaming. John. Do we have any Game of Thrones fans in the audience today? Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, if you weren't, I thought maybe you might be in the wrong room or something. But I'm going to talk to you about redefining casual gaming. I don't know what casual games mean, other than that they're games that aren't a pain in the ass to install. But uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about how I think this market of games that we're all here for has been changing. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I think the market itself, what the big trends are, and then some of the things we've learned from building Game of Thrones within this market. So our company, Disruptor Beam, our vision is to build games that are all about these awesome worlds that people want to inhabit. So Game of Thrones, and you can think about the other types of intellectual property that are out there. Our first game is Game of Thrones Ascent. And it's a show that's watched by 10 million, 15 million, I don't know how many millions of people, but tons and tons of people watch this show every week. Millions and millions of people have read the books. And as for some reason, even though it's an incredibly harsh environment that I definitely wouldn't want to live in in real life, people would like to have a fantasy life within this world. And to give you a little bit of background on the game we've created, we launched it only a few months ago. We've gotten about 2 million installs and our CPI is about a penny a user. So that's um, one of the big things that's different about us and something that I think is also changing in the market overall, which is CPIs have gone way up for acquiring customers within the casual games market. And by embracing a world like Game of Thrones, we've been able to decrease the CPI dramatically, which I think is why franchises, why licenses are becoming so critical in this market. But it also means that our business model is quite a bit different. We're less focused on acquiring and paying for an install to turn someone into an account for us, much more focused on getting a great base of customers that really love the game and then making sure that they continue to love the game. And it's a different approach to the market versus having to optimize towards CPI, which I think requires certain types of games to be developed. So just so you know where I'm coming from, my own background is I've been in the game industry on and off for about 20 years, but I've also done things in game analytics, in um, ad networks, in software infrastructure, and I put together a team of people who had very diverse skill sets, people who have had AAA game experience, um, people who have had casual game experiences, and we really wanted to create the kind of game that we really liked ourselves. To give you a sense of how I think some of the market has changed over the last few years, originally the social game market, another term that I'm not totally in love with because I think social games are any kind of game that people play with each other, but the original social game network model was delivery through social networks, customer acquisition was largely through the organic channels that were on the social networks coupled with some amount of advertising, kind of that CPI to LTV arbitrage that Will spoke about this morning. The real key competitive advantage was rapid time to market. So if you had a good game design model and you could bring it to, get to market at a low CPI and generate a profit on it, that was the model. And the economics of that favored really low cost software development with a big, huge marketing component to acquire customers. I think the market is evolving a lot though. So Number one, distribution is not so much around the social networks anymore. It's also around the mobile devices and the new types of platforms that are people are using. Customer acquisition, I think, must shift towards more fan-oriented, community-driven customer acquisition because you can't win the battle of ever-increasing CPIs. So these days, people seem to be happy if they could get 50 cents to a dollar CPI. A lot of people pay $2 CPIs. That's very, very difficult to make the economics of that work versus the market of three or four years ago where there were CPIs of five cents, 10 cents. So for us, it's embracing the fan base to try to lower the CPI. The key competitive advantage is higher production values, making great games, 
and really having that access to either a license in our case or building a franchise that people want to keep coming back to. I'll tell you a little bit about the gameplay features in Game of Thrones Ascent in case you haven't played the game, just to understand where we're coming from in the market. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the trends in the overall casual games market or what has started to be called the mid-core gaming market and, and what it means to be in that market. So first of all, Game of Thrones Ascent at its heart is a resource management game where you're building up a town, you're investing in buildings, you're doing crafting, you're creating items. We have a very complex crafting hierarchy that is similar to what you'd find in an MMORPG game, meaning that there's a lot of inputs and outputs and constant processes of bringing the, the productions of your town back into producing other things. It also has alliances. It has player versus player functionality. So players in the world of Game of Thrones don't want to just play a single player game. They want to be in conflict or in cooperation with other people who are in this world. And another really unique aspect of this game is the idea of episodic content tie-ins. So we released the game in February, which was a little bit before the show started. We started practicing what it would mean to bring weekly new content into the game. But then once the season hit at the end of March, we started delivering episodic content every week in the game. So every Sunday, an episode would, would air Within about 12 hours of that, we were deploying new items, new quests, new content that was just about the show that you just watched. And that was an important part of our business model because it allowed us to really hook the game directly to that viewing experience so that we're extending the community, the whole experience of being part of watching the show. Now the game becomes a new way to, to participate in that community. Another big part of our game, which goes hand in hand with this idea of episodic content, is dialogue-driven quests. And this was an important aspect for us because it was so different than what had been done in social games before. So if you've ever played a Bioware game, for example, where you've got a lot of dialogue and, and decision tree stuff to do along the way, we have a very uh, enriched quest system within Game of Thrones Ascent with now over 1,500 quests, all with dialogue, <laughs> with character impact, with alignment choices that you can make along the way. So for example, in, um, if you're watching the show, you've seen how Ned is sort of more oriented with the old ways, so he uses the sword to, to perform an execution, versus the new ways might be you'd, you'd have an executioner do your dirty work for you. That's an example of an alignment decision in our game, and as you traverse the world of Game of Thrones Ascent, you are making alignment decisions that define who you are within this world. So is this mid-core gaming? So this is the new term in the industry. Here's my definition of what mid-core gaming is. I think it's just a way for executives and investors to sort of bundle the trend that is already happening in the industry as a way that other people who make those investments can understand it. I don't think mid-core is actually a definition of a market in the traditional sense because no one goes to midcoregames.com and like plays games there. I don't know if that site exists, by the way. Uh, all, me all markets evolve for all types of media, and games are really just another type of media. A good example that I like to borrow is Steven Johnson's analysis of how television has evolved over time. So if you look at that, what that's showing is Starsky and Hutch from the 70s and how they had essentially one linear plot that went through the entire episode without switching between characters. And then you get to something like Hill Street Blues where it's switching between characters. And then you get something even more recent like The Sopranos where it's not only switching between characters, you actually have intersecting plots so that the plots interface with each other even some, in some cases between episodes. So over time, media consumption tends to get more complex. People have a t an increasing taste over time for, for experiences in their media consumption that stimulate more of their intellectual capacity. And I think Game of Thrones continues that because if you've watched the show, you've seen how many characters there are. It's actually almost a bewildering a number of characters when you're first sitting down and watching it. The new number of characters that are introduced in every episode is pretty amazing. So there's just a lot of complexity in the TV watching experience. I think games are like that. So games, 
as time has gone on, people are looking for more and more sophisticated experiences in terms of the narrative structure and the things that they can do within games. So you can't build, in many cases, the casual game of five or 10 years ago and hope that that will be as interesting to people in today's market. And it certainly will, in many cases, not monetize as well. So where does that co complexity manifest in Games, I think, as you start with a, this is sort of borrowed from um, Bartle's structure of the market, if you're familiar with it, but we've kind of recast it as, as our view of the way social games in general, meaning games that multiple people play, interact with. The basic game is an immersive experience. It's one where you're just sort of entering a world or you're entering an experience and you're doing some set of skills and actions. By introducing more people to it, so you have many players, you start to open up new facets of the experience. And that's where co cooperation and competition end up being a lot more important. So I think that the trend, the way game complexity is going to manifest as time continues to proceed here is, just as we saw more narrative complexity in TV shows over time, we'll see that narrative complexity increase within games, but we'll also see more ways the players can cooperate with each other and more ways the players can compete with each other. Alongside of that, just going back to the TV and media industry for a moment, is this idea of the way media consumption itself has changed over the last few years. So you don't just watch a TV set anymore. You also have all these other devices that you can use to consume television content. And that was an important thing for us to look at as well, because being a game based on a television show, we wanted to think about, well, how are people actually going to consume the game, Is it the, the television content? Is it going to be different than the way they had consumed television in the past, and indeed it is in this particular case because people use HBO Go, for example, and they'll watch the show in bursts or at times when they feel like it, and um, that was an important aspect of it as well. There's been this new trend, though, towards what they call second screen um, entertainment, which is this idea that you've got another screen like your iPad with you, and that's allowing you to access some ancillary content about the TV show or what you're watching. My view is that second screen is good for sports and reality TV and infotainment, these sort of information rich things that are not about a totally engaging narrative. Um, in my view, second screen is actually bad for games and bad for dramatic television. I have this concept that I call just having another screen. You know, you don't want to be interrupted while you're watching Game of Thrones with some iPad interaction, which is taking you out of the action and vice versa. Overall, people are looking for experiences, and they want the experience to transcend that one television show that they're watching. In essence, they want it to be part of a community. And this is just an interesting chart that I've been looking at for a few years here, which is what do people actually derive happiness from? And people have found, and some researchers have found that um, as your income increases, you actually derive less and less value out of just having more things, but you derive more value out of experiences. And that's ultimately what I'm talking about here, is having a television show and a game that, that are individual experiences, but in aggregate, it gives you the experience of being part of this world and being part of the community of that world in an interesting way. So is this the digital living room? Because this is the buzzword of a decade ago, is the, the digital living room. And I'd argue that the, li the digital living room is no longer a place. Um, it's actually a virtualized living room with all the things that surround us. It's Facebook, it's our mobile devices, it's things like that. So we wanted to bring a social gaming experience into this new digital living room, this expansive virtualized digital living room. And we saw an opportunity to bring social gamers some of this dialogue-driven, quest-driven interaction that had been popular in Bioware games like Mass Effect and Knights of the Old Republic that we had really enjoyed. We thought that gamers were ready for it. We also wanted to create this continuum between watching the TV show or reading the books and then playing in a world, which really hadn't been done before. And we thought that if they were watching a sophisticated show like Game of Thrones, they could also be ready for a more sophisticated game. And in our view, again, going back to that second screen comparison, it's not so much about there just being one bubble here where you're watching a show and 
then the game is just something you sort of do within that. There's all these touch points. There's the mobile universe, there's the television universe, there's the social universe. All of those represent funnels for kind of re-engaging with the, with the world of Game of Thrones. And there's intersection points between them. So for example, we have content that airs in the game right after you watch the TV show. But each of them also are, provide their own unique experiences. Again, in aggregate, provide this complete community experience for being part of it. So we had this idea of having a more sophisticated game and quests. There was just one problem that we had when we were developing this game last year, which is every publisher we talked to in 2012 thought this was a horrible idea. They didn't think um, people would like this kind of game. So what were some of the things they told us? Social gamers don't want to read. That was one of the things we were told. Social gamers just want to click things. They don't want to have to think. These are actual quotes that we got from publishers. Um, my favorite, can you make it more like Clash of Clans? Because whatever the most recent, most popular game is, is what every game should be more like. Um, so we ultimately decided, and this kind of goes hand in hand with some of the stuff Will talked about this morning, that number one, it's better to be loved by a dedicated, loyal audience of fans that are going to stick with it rather than treat it as just a triviality. And number two, we had a vision for our company. Story, narrative, quests, this kind of content was going to be important to us. We thought there was a market need for it. We were going to stick with it. So what came out of that was really deciding on what were we going to have to be really great at as a company. And I think that as you think about the games you want to develop, there's a lot of things you have to be good at. I mean, you have to be good at hundreds of things to deliver a game to the market. But you also have to kind of decide what are the things you're going to be really great at. Those are going to be your core competencies as a company. Number one, we knew we had to be authentic to the source material. And if we weren't, fans would hate us. So we wanted to make sure that this idea of consequence and conflict and bring the actual story of Game of Thrones into the game would be really important. Number two, we had to make it relevant in the social context. So it wouldn't be enough to just take the Bioware choose your own adventure model and bring that into the social game environment. We had to make it socially relevant, meaning for us, it's more like passing a choose your own adventure book back and forth between players, which was kind of our unique innovation for how social storytelling and questing would work. And third, given that we wanted to bring content into the game all the time, um, pegged to these weekly episodes, we had to create a really efficient platform for making that happen every week. So it's one thing to be agile and kind of decide week to week that you want to change up your content and do things. It's another to do that at the same time as realizing that there is this other world of content happening and that you've got to also pull that into the game. So each of those would be sort of a lengthy talk in itself. And I'm be happy to answer questions on them in a couple of minutes. But that's what we decided would be important for us. And I think as you build your games, think about what you're going to have to be really great at. So the publishers didn't back us. We figured out how to do it on our own without any third parties or publishers, which I guess is another theme you're hearing out here. Um, the ultimate thing that we measure ourselves by is what our players are saying about the product. And the kind of comments we got from our fan base after building this kind of game was really encouraging to us because while our numbers are not as big as, say, a Farmville 2, our numbers are fairly significant. A couple million people have installed the game. And the people that are sticking with it really, really love the game. And I think that that's the test of a great game, is whether people love it. Because there's lots of games that are good, and people play it and be entertained. But for people to say, wow, this is the best Facebook game I've ever played, or this is possibly the best game that I've ever played, that's what you look for when you're building a new game. And uh, I feel like mission accomplished in that respect. We'd like to just continue to do that and bring it to even more players. So just to kind of wrap up here, in conclusion, games are getting more complex. There's not just a mid-core market as if there's this other compartment within an overall market. It's actually a trend towards increasing complexity in games and recognizing that that's happening and that your consumer is changing, not just the market, but your actual consumer is changing, is really relevant. Players, and what we learned is that players will embrace the story-driven narrative content. They will read stuff um, if they're interested in it and they want to be part of that world. And they want to inhabit these worlds through multiple forms of media consumption, be it Facebook, web browsers, 
media devices, um, mobile devices, and so forth. So that's it, and I've got time for a couple of questions. Thank you, John. That was an excellent talk. Um, before we go to the audience, uh, one cent cost per player is a real achievement, and the one variable that wreaks the most havoc on a profit and loss sheet is definitely the cost per player, and it seems to me like you're saying that by acquiring the license, you were able to bring those down. What advice would you give to a developer because I'm guessing George R. R. Martin is not your next door neighbor. So um, what advice would you give to a developer if they decide to go the franchise licensing route uh, to boot that process off? Well, there, there's two pieces of it. So first of all, you don't have to license something to create a franchise. I think League of Legends, for example, is an example of a, something that's a franchise now. So. I think to be having a long-term vision for whatever your content is and that you're creating something even bigger than one particular game and that you're creating a world that you want to bring people into over the long haul, that's important because when you start producing sequels and new releases and things like that, your, CPA will go, your CPI will go down long-term. For getting licenses, I mean, my main advice is be patient. We didn't get game of, the Game of Thrones license very quickly and we started this company about three years ago and the first year we were in business was essentially spent talking to potential licensors of content. And for us, we had a very, um, we, we kind of held to our guns that if we're gonna build this business this way, we would only do a major license. We would only really go after something with really significant IP with millions and millions of um, people in that community. And we stuck to that and that just meant we needed a lot of time. So, patience. Thank you, John, that was a good uh, presentation. Uh, my question was, how do you deal with the, the power curve ramp up um, of premium virtual good items for these more hardcore players? Did you guys have a, a plan in place to address that? Um, well, in our game, we always felt it was important that anybody could play the game whether or not you decide to monetize, but to, to buy the virtual goods. So in our game, if you buy virtual goods, you're effectively increasing the probability that you will complete certain missions. Um, and you can also use virtual goods as an accelerant to speed through the process faster. The, but the game itself has been designed so that everybody could play the game and you could continue to enjoy it and you could choose to invest more time into the game, and that would be one method for getting through the game content. But I think that's, that's sort of the essence of that. You have to pay something to slow down the power curve, and whether that's money or time, um, both of those are valid. You can't have a game, I don't, in my view, you can't have a game where it's sort of, there's not an option to do nothing, so you can't, you can't just have a game where to proceed, you have to pay at a certain point. That'll just alienate people. Thank you, John. Um, the one cent CPI, when you incorporate the cost of the license, what does it end up actually being? I mean, the kind of there's a trade-off there. So, we, I mean, we have operating costs that happen on the back end, and certainly it's higher than one cent if you look at it from the standpoint of all the operating costs. Um, I don't know what the number is offhand, and I probably couldn't say if, if I did know it offhand, but um, the, the issue with CPI is that the risk, it, the CPI as it's typically defined is capital that you risk upfront for the hope that you're then going to acquire customers and that you can accurately predict LTV over time. Um, the other problem with CPI is that over time, CPIs tend to increase and it's very easy for those lines to cross at any point in time in your business. And any time you're buying a customer, you tend to be buying a lower quality customer than you're acquiring organically. So from a funnel standpoint, the costs for us come at the back end once we've gotten customers who are happy with the game and they're monetizing and then we pay royalties as opposed to upfront taking the risk on that capital. Saw one more over here. Um, yeah, I was just wondering how the relationship is with the producer, like their involvement 
with what you're doing? Do they speak a lot into it? And I was also interested in what kind of lead time you had in between getting the assets from the producer and releasing these on a weekly basis. So that, that's a great question. So by producer, I'm assuming you mean HBO, the yeah, whoever you like, the, show run, the showrunners. Yeah. Um, so our team, our writing team, gets to see all the episodes well before they air, like a couple months in advance. So we have some knowledge, and of course, they don't diverge too much from the books. So we had some general familiarity with, with what's going to happen anyway. Um, However, part of the process is developing that well-oiled machine with HBO in this case, where HBO has been really good and efficient to work with in terms of delivering them the things that we wanted to put in the game two or three weeks ahead of the actual release of that content in the game. They approve it, they comment on stuff, we take into account their comments and turn it around. But um, you know that, that's key, is having a partner who understands that you're in a real-time business and that they can't sit on it for months. That's one of the things we really had to learn to do well. Great talk, John. I don't know about those one penny CPIs, but I suspect that little finger had something to do with it. <laughs> Game of Thrones jokes, guys. You're all going to lose your geek card if you don't laugh at that. So coming up next, the evil game design challenge. It's going to be evil. <laughs> 